So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Nicole Biebel. Uh, I am the um, executive manager of EU Polarnet, and I'm coming from the Alfred Wiener Institute for Polar Marine Research in Germany. And I will uh, guide you through this webinar on the Integrated European Polar Research Program. You see here also uh, several other faces at the moment. These are our speakers, which I will introduce you later today. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar and we have a lot of attendees. So we are very, very happy uh, that there is so much interest here uh, on the uh, work EU Polarnet has performed. Uh, the following webinar, which is called Stronger Together, European Cooperation for Polar uh, Science and Society and uh, the Integrated European Polar Research Programme, <coughs> will give you an overview about the work which we have performed in the last five years. Um, I will show you some slides now. Sorry, just a moment. Um, what is EU Polarnet? So just a short uh, um, introduction to the project which has performed the work. So the title of this webinar says Stronger Together European Cooperation for Science and Society. And that's exactly what we have experienced in the last five years of the work of EU Polarnet. It is a coordination and support action which is funded by the European Commission in Horizon 2020 and it's ending this month. And what we will present today to you is the final deliverable of uh, EU Polarnet, the, Europe the integrated European Polar Research Programme. Um, EU Polarnet is quite a large consortium. Uh, we have 17 European countries participating, uh, 22 consortium partners, and we have made a lot of agreements with international partners, uh, formal agreements with 24 cooperation partners. And uh, the aim of EU Polarnet uh, in the last four, five years was, first of all, to improve the cooperation, coordination, and also the engagement of the European polar community and then uh, we had an ongoing and a very intensive cooperation with the European Commission on several uh, themes related to polar research. Our main uh, task was to develop this European polar research program. And in addition to that, EU Polarnet will also deliver an infrastructure access and usage plan for this uh, uh, research program. Uh, which is currently under development. It's, uh, it's a white paper on infrastructure access, interoperability and implementation for the research program and it will be finalized also this month. Um, before we go into the exact meeting, um, I want to say a few words about the European Polar Research Program which is, let's say, EU uh, Polarnet's attempt to really co-design a research program on a European level and also together with all of those people uh, uh, who are affected by changes in the polar regions, living in the polar regions, but also here in Europe and beyond. We have identified six overarching research needs, uh, which we will explain in detail in the next hours. And these research needs have been defined by an intensive uh, consultation of as many stake and right holders we can put uh, address during the last five years. Marino L, who will shortly follow with the talk, will give you a bit more introduction into this. All the uh, research needs we are identifying are very overarching um, and they are um, needed transdisciplinary plenary approach and uh, we should be seen as more giving a direction towards the research which should be done uh, in the future. So um, even if this European Polar Research Programme on the first side has uh, only research in it with a high societal relevance, that's not really true 
uh, it's, on the contrary, we also uh, put forward a lot of basic research which we urgently need to uh, fill knowledge gaps uh, in the research areas addressed to the EPLP. I will stop here now and I will not say much more about the webinar today and I only want to give you a short uh, overview about the agenda. So this is the plan for today. Uh, after two more introductory speeches, we will then hear um, um, an introduction to all six chapters of the research program, always presented by the lead authors of this research program. And at the end, we will have a discussion round and a conclusion, uh, a conclusion talk by Kirsi Latula from the European Polar. Some technical details for this webinar. We have a lot of attendees, so I just saw that we are well beyond 200 participants. That's why we have switched off the audio, video and chat functions for all of you. When you have questions, and we hope you have a lot of questions, please type these questions in the question and answer box with your name and name also the receiver of your question if it's a person who gives a presentation. We will then pass these questions to the respective speaker. As I said, we hope that we will get a lot of questions and we ask for your understanding in case we are not able to get, discuss them all in the webinar today because we do not have too much time. And then at the end, I have to tell you that this webinar is recorded. It is also live streamed at the moment via the EPB YouTube channel and uh, for all of the, you who might drop out earlier or would like to see it again, you can also access it via the EU Polarnet YouTube channel after the meeting. Uh, this was my short introduction and I will pass the floor now to uh, our first speaker, which is, who is uh, Jürki Suominen from the European Commission. He's Deputy Head of Unit for the Healthy Ocean and Seas Unit, um, which is belonging to DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Yuki, are you there and can uh, take over? I see you here. Yuki, Yuki you're, uh, you're muted at the moment. Yuki, you're muted. Uh, I see you here. Can you give us a sign that you are there? He sent me several emails that he cannot log in, but I see him here. Nothing. He's still having trouble with the, the link. I'll... Um look into it it's quick. otherwise I would suggest that we uh, start first with the presentation of Marie Noel and then come back to Yuki and uh, um, give um, have his speech afterwards is this okay and David could you please contact Yuki by email he sent me a lot of emails um, then um, we we will move on with the introduction to the research program, which is given, I have to check now, sorry, which is presented by Marie-Noël Rousset, who is the lead author of the research program. Uh, Marie-Noël Rousset is from CNRS in France, and she will give us now an overview on how we develop the research program and what is all behind. So, uh, Marie-Noël, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Nicole. I'm trying to... Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to join this webinar to present some details uh, of uh, what is this uh, European Polar Research Program. Uh, my uh, presentation will not be so much about the scientific content of this uh, program that will be done by the chapter leads afterwards. I'm rather concentrating on the process of development of this program and uh, that will be uh, the main focus of this presentation. Okay, as Nicole mentioned, the European Polar Research Programme was commissioned by Europe 
And the goal of it was to provide a guidance tool for uh, the European research strategy and uh, management in the coming years. As stated in the document, uh, the goal was to identify the knowledge gaps to be filled in order to answer the current needs and expectations of European societies regarding the polar regions. Mm -hmm. So knowledge gaps include all kinds of research, including, of, including, of course, uh, uh, basic research and uh, from applied research, from basic research to applied research. Sorry. And uh, when we call, when we talk about European societies, it uh, includes, of course, a wide range of different stakeholders. This is a big challenge, but on the other hand, it really corresponds to the central motivation of the EU Polarnet project. Okay, the challenge, in fact, is to set up an inclusive uh, approach in which the scientific the knowledge gaps identified by the scientific experts and the needs which are communicated by stake and right holders can be put together in order to uh, identify future polar research priorities. This approach is somewhat unusual. Usually scientists are asked to uh, give uh, to, to demonstrate the usefulness of their research to society. Here it was a bit the opposite. It was what kind of research can you design to best serve society? So the EPRP, in fact, what I call the EPRP, the European Polar Research Program, sorry, was in fact a, a long-term uh, process which uh, lasted through, throughout the whole duration of the EU Polarnet project. In fact, what we wanted to take as a methodology was to initiate a dialogue between scientists and stakeholders from the very beginning of the project. This co-designing, in fact, was felt to be the best way to ensure that the stakeholder and right holder needs would be fully taken into account in the design of the research priorities. So we had to proceed step by step. First, we engaged a dialogue with the stakeholders starting from a stakeholder mapping. Then we had to, we didn't start from scratch, we did a, a thorough review of the existing documents on polar science strategy and polar science plans. Then we uh, ended up with a, a, a stakeholder documents that serve for the drafting of the, of the polar program itself. And we finally submitted the document to a series of different experts uh, to check that the document was fully, uh, uh, agree fully with the expectation of the stakeholders. So it is important to note that this dialogue that we had with the stakeholder, in fact, uh, uh, was there throughout the full duration of the process. And this was uh, important because it's, it's only after, uh, on year four, that we actually started to draft the document. I'm now uh, giving you some, uh, I will give you some, uh, comments on the most important landmarks that were uh, punctuated the course of this uh, EPRP development. As I said, we didn't start from zero and uh, we initiated an analysis of all the already published sci polar science plan and strategies. And we draw from this information a synthesis from almost 150 publications of national documents, international consortia and major scientific cluster. This synthesis, in fact, was published as the first deliverable of the EU Polarnet project, which is report on prioritized objectives and in polar research. Then from this review, we had to consider two specific aspects of the development of this program. First was the approach, how to engage the dialogue with right and stakeholders to collect their needs and how to translate those into research questions. Another challenge, of course, was the drafting of the document and make sure that we involved a wide range of expertise from different communities. So a major step in this dialogue with the stakeholders was the launch in spring 2017 of a public consultation with the goal that where the goal was to collect answers to a single question. What are the most important topics in relation to your works? and everyday life in the polar region that should be solved by future research. We, in fact, in the, uh, received a lot of answers, more than 500, from 36 countries. And what I'm showing here is a diagram where you see the percentages of answers in each given category. I'm sorry, I should say that the, the categories 
were predefined, so you had to choose one category which was the most important for your uh, needs. And we see here that the percentages in each categories are rather uh, uh, same order of magnitude, which shows that the stakeholder needs are distributed across a large, uh, wide range of uh, uh, disciplines. At the same time, we also organized throughout the duration of the project uh, several workshops and events dedicated to the stakeholders. I show you a picture of side events to large polar conferences. And in addition, in order to um, demonstrate the uh, relevance of this co-designing of research priority, we organized in uh, 2016 a workshop, joint workshop with stakeholders and uh, scientists in order to uh, test the dialogue between these two communities and it was demonstrated that the, this workshop really fostered the interaction between the different communities and in fact it led to the publication of five white papers which serve as a very interesting input to the uh, European Polar Research Program. So the ultimate uh, goal of this uh, dialogue between science and stakeholders was this uh, 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 analysis of the information which has been which had been gathered by these different consultations and workshops. And in fact, we uh, draw from this analysis, we try to cluster the stakeholder information into broad overarching and transdisciplinary thematic areas with the aim to, to break down this uh, large uh, thematic area into more specific research questions. So, as a, so the, the, the final analysis was uh, synthesis, synthesized into what we call a stakeholder document. And this mind map, on the, this complex mind map on the right, left hand side shows you a kind of a summary of this stakeholder document. Each branch corresponds to a different thematic area. Each color traces the origin of the information. And if I try to, if, I, if you want to detail a bit more what is in this different thematic area, you have on the right hand side a zoom on one of these areas which is prosperous living and working in the polar regions. And you can see that uh, this theme is broken down into nested, a lot of nested subtopics and each subtopic has been identified from keywords in the original stakeholder information. So from there, we, were, we, we had to uh, start the drafting of the document. And for that, of course, there was a, a expert team, scientific expert team, which was uh, constituted and the work of these experts was to extract the research question which would best respond to the stakeholder needs which had been identified in the stakeholder document. So here you see that the document was finally structured around this research needs and we have, as Nicole said, six major research needs. First one is a better understanding of climate change in the polar regions. Second one is informed weather and climate action. Third one, resilient socio-ecological systems. Fourth one is prospering communities in the Arctic. The fifth one is challenges and opportunities in polar operations. And the final one is inclusive creation, access and usage of knowledge. I will not give any details on the content of this chapter because these will be given afterwards. But finally, what you can say from that is that each research needs makes a separate chapter and all the chapters are structured the same way, an introduction, a societal relevance section, a list of research questions, and a section on resource requirements. For each chapter, we nominated two chapter leads and a total of four to seven contributors contributed to the drafting of the chapters. So if you just want to make an overall, uh, overall analysis of the societal relevance of the polar research program, you identify cross-cutting uh, issues which are, you can find in the different chapters, although they are treated from different disciplinary angles. So I have listed here a few of those which I think are important and common to all chapters. First is the assessment and prediction of changes and vulnerability in natural polar environments. 
Second issue is identification of mechanisms that can sustain improved well-being and quality of life. Another one was the knowledge of environmental, technical, and societal factors controlling safe, sustainable, and just operation in the polar regions. Another one is searching and access to environmental and socio-economical data and improved interoperability. Optimization of the food processing chain from identification of information needs to design of relevant tools from stakeholders. And an issue also which was quite uh, usually fine was about integration of different knowledge sources into innovative education and training systems. So another exercise which is interesting to do on this document is to try to map the different research needs on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is what is shown here. And what you can remark is that uh, first, you can find a lot of SDGs in all research uh, needs, which means that they're all individually very relevant to the Sustainable Development Goals. You can see also that in total, the full document addresses the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, if you look across the chapters, there are quite a few development goals which are in common, which just demonstrate the cross, the overarching or the cross-cutting uh, character of the program. For example, you can see uh, SDG 11 on sustainable cities. You can see uh, uh, SDG 16 in all chapters of the research program. So in order to check that the European Polar Research Program was really responding to the expectation of the different stakeholder communities that had contributed to the program, we had to submit it to the multiple review process. After a preliminary review by the EU Polar Net Consortium, the draft was submitted to a total of more than 35 national and international reviewers, individual reviewers. It was also submitted to representatives of the different uh, international polar bodies, which are listed here in the external expert advisory board of the project. And finally, it was also submitted to the project stakeholder panel, which is made of representatives of the different uh, stakeholder communities that had been approached in during the process of the program. So what lesson did we learn from this document development process? I think one thing is clear is that we benefit of adopting an, an inclusive approach in which right and stakeholders needs and research challenges are considered all together from the beginning of the process. This is very important to start with all the community in. And the second lesson maybe is that there is a necessity to build a common understanding of research question based on integration of scientific expertise, of course, but also local and traditional knowledge, a strong engagement of all potentially concerned parties, and this requires often an iterative process. And finally, that transdisciplinary approaches are really lead really to, to the uh, emergence of innovative research questions. I would like to finish this presentation by stressing that uh, entire European Polar Research Program will not have existed without the tremendous work of the experts and the European Consortium, and now without the constant and efficient effort of the coordinating team that we, you see here, this uh, European EPRP working group was made of people who really ensured that the overall process was always alive and on track, and also the contributed with a very valuable expertise to the quality of the document. So I leave now the floor to the real experts, which will tell you everything about the science. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie-Noël. Um, I will shortly check if there is a question uh, to you. Can you see it also? Uh, there's a question from, uh, because we have a one question time, um, I, I will read it to you. Um, it's from Yevgeny Aksen, Aksenov from the National Oceanography Center in the UK. Marie Noel, 
Thanks very much for your presentation. A large part of the socio-economical activities and challenges are occurring in the areas outside the member partners of the program. Is there any mechanism in place to main links and communication with the non-partner states or regions? This also concerns logistical support for the research in Siberia and Canada. Well, I think this uh, question is a very important question and uh, I'm not sure I'm the one who could better answer this. I think I would leave this, uh, the answer to Nicole because there are a lot of, uh, uh, if, if there is a strong effort now to open as much as possible this uh, exercise to all countries involved and interested in polar regions. So Nicole, maybe you want to say a word about that. I would like to say that uh, EU Polarnet has made uh, a lot of international connections uh, during the last five years and uh, we has, have also um, evolved, involved a lot of international partners into the design of the white papers and the European Polar Research Programme to also um, um, uh, include the non-European view. Um, Parts of the research programs, we have to admit, are of course uh, designed from a European perspective. It's a European polar research program, but it is uh, it, a lot of these uh, themes we are addressing are relevant to the whole polar area. So to the Arctic as a whole or the Antarctic as a whole. This is my short question now, and uh, my short answer now. Um, Marino, could you please stop your sharing of the screen and then yeah. I will pass the floor now because Yuki now informed me that he is here. So um, I will pass the floor to Yuki Suominen from, uh, the, uh, from uh, the European Commission. He's the deputy head of the healthy, no, I'm, of the healthy ocean and seas unit. Yuki, can you speak? I think he's still having troubles uh, joining. It's, I think it's due to the security settings on his laptop and not allowing Zoom. Okay. Um, um, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. That, um, is this your Here he is now. Hello. Yuki, could you uh, switch on your audio and then... Fantastic. Okay, finally okay, on. Okay, thank you. It's your turn. I have already introduced you, so it's your turn, Yuki. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good mor morning. And uh, I'm very sorry about this uh, delay. The uh, security setup on my corporate laptop was being difficult, so now I'm finally joining you. Um, via the phone. Uh, but I am particularly happy to uh, virtually see you online today in the uh, EU PolarNet webinar Stronger Together uh, during this uh, particularly difficult time for Europe and the world. And uh, um, it is indeed reassuring to see that the polar research community is alive and well and that it continues to work, albeit under different conditions. It is, of course, unfortunate that we cannot have a physical event for the presentation of the integrated European Polar Research Programme. But uh, we are very grateful for the EU PolarNet who organized this uh, virtual meeting. And the presentation and discussion on the Polar Research Programme is very timely for us in the Commission. As we in the Commission services, we are in the middle of the planning cycle for the next EU research framework program called Horizon Europe. And um, more specifically, we are developing and discussing with our member states a strategic planning document for the first four years of Horizon Europe. And uh, very, very soon, we'll also start to develop the actual first Horizon Europe work program for the 2021 and 2022 calls for proposals. And 
during this process, we'll of course take stock of the achievements of existing and finished research and innovation projects and where are the main knowledge gaps and research needs and where are the promising innovative solutions that we could further build on, for example, in the demonstration projects. Now, in the current research framework program, Horizon 2020, EU has already funded polar research related projects worth more than 170 million euro. And this figure will exceed 200 million euro by the end of it. And I am convinced that this very strong project portfolio can make also a very strong contribution, for example, in the next uh, Arctic Science Ministerial, which is uh, now in preparation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you, as the research community, you will also actively participate in the research community workshops in preparation of the ASM3. And the next one will actually take place Monday next week. Now, going back to Horizon Europe, um, while the budget and financial breakdown between different components of Horizon Europe are yet to be agreed by the legislators, I can safely say that polar research will be firmly embedded in Horizon Europe. The strategic planning process, which I mentioned earlier, will focus in particular on the global challenges and European industrial competitiveness pillar of Horizon Europe. And within this pillar, we have a cluster called food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment, where polar research priorities can be addressed in a top-down programmatic fashion. Polar research may, of course, be supported by the bottom-up pillars and components of Horizon Europe as well, like the European Research Council. And the European, uh, the, uh, the Horizon Europe strategic planning uh, phase gives great emphasis to the Green Deal, the climate targets, and the ways to achieve climate neutrality in Europe through major contribution of research and innovation to actually guide the complex transformations which are needed for the climate neutrality. And in this context, of course, polar research is very, very important as the Arctic and the Antarctic are among the most sensitive and fragile re regions of the globe to human-induced climate change and other stressors. So sustained polar research and observation observations are increasingly important and necessary to understand the rapid changing, uh, changes taking place in these regions and also to predict their regional and global impacts. Research is of course also needed for assessing vulnerabilities and building resilience in polar ecosystems and societies. And with this, I'm concluding my brief introduction and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing and seeing the proposal for an integrated European polar research program today, as well as the presentations about the more detailed research needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yoki. Very promising speech to us from the polar research community. Um, we are a bit out of time, so that's why I um, would like uh, to suggest that we move on now with going into the research program direct. Yes, yes, please do um, so. And uh, apologies for the delay. That's, uh, it's our fate with the video conferences that there are always some technical issues. You cannot avoid it. Yeah. Um, then I think we start now with a presentation of uh, the uh, research needs. Um, it's most likely the reason why most of you are attending this uh, webinar and we start with the first research need which will be presented by the lead authors. Um, the lead authors for the first research need which is better understanding of climate change uh, and weather extremes in the polar region and it's linked to lower latitudes. Uh, Zina, Zina Beck Andersson from the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. 
and John Daniel Paris from the Laboratory of Climate and Environmental Science at the Institute Pierre Simon Laplace of Climate Science in France. So, Sina and John Daniel, it's your floor. You can share your screen and start. Thank you for the for the very good introduction, Nicole. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, attending. I will now uh, work on sharing my screen. Okay. So I will now um, present the research need one, better understanding of climate change uh, on weather extreme in polar regions and links to lower latitude. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my main co-author, Signe, uh, and also a list of collaborators who have uh, willingly given of their time to work on this. It was a collective effort, uh, and I'm very happy to present the result of this, uh, of this effort now. So the research need one is structured uh, in a uh, different uh, question. I will introduce the general context now. So the polar regions are both vulnerable and critical in the climate system. This is the key point of, the, of, the, of this research need. Uh, they are con connected to global climate through several uh, feedback mechanisms uh, like surface albedo uh, feedback. You have a changing ecosystem on surface atmosphere fluxes. You have heat transport by the certain polar ocean in the southern hemisphere. And then you have more regional specificities. The Arctic is the fastest warming region in the world, for example. The Arctic seasonal sea ice, land ice, snow cover in spring are decreasing. Permafrost is warming with increasing, increased thawing and subsidence. So these are clear signals that we see already. Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets may experience instabilities in response to enhanced surface melting and ice shelf collapse, as well as marine terminating glacial retreat. This is a big challenge that we see uh, emerging. There are vulnerabilities and remoteness. Climate change impacts the regional population through access to food and resources, vulnerable infrastructure and changes in lifestyle. But the, the, these regions are so uh, difficult to access that they are poorly covered by observation networks. They are hard to reach also for scientists. So we need a bit better understanding of, of, this, uh, of these questions. Uh, Europe, we need a European research program that aim at increasingly increasing predictability and reduce uncertainties associated with the key processes. And we need a scientific research that involves a portfolio and discipline of methods that would be that has to be very interdisciplinary by nature. Uh, it has to involve also a variety of uh, measurement type from satellite and in situ observation to coupled numerical modeling. Uh, and we need to work at interfaces between compartments. Societal relevance. Uh, so this is of course very important for society, both uh, globally and regionally. Uh, so the global societies are strong climate links. Uh, uh, think about sea level rise, ocean warming and circulation change. This has impacts everywhere around the globe. Uh, extreme weather events are also linked to polar region, uh, fresh water flow to the ocean. And finally, there, is a, there are global economic links as well. Uh, increased resource extraction, uh, new shipping lanes, changing international geopolitics uh, uh, the, in both polar regions. Uh, then think about the regional uh, relevance. Uh, you have uh, traditional food sourcing issues, which is very uh, important, especially in the Arctic, of course. Uh, traditional lifestyles that are changing. There are changes in landscape uh, uh, with coastal erosion, subsidence, mass movement, and thaw lake dynamics due to permafrost degradation. There is threat to infrastructure from thawing permafrost and changes in the snow ice season. Uh, the threat to infrastructure from thawing permafrost, you have an example to the right, which is very recent. It was end of May. There is a big oil spill happening now in, uh, in, the, in northwestern Siberia, in the Norilsk region, on the Ambarnaya River. There was a big uh, diesel uh, tank that collapsed, uh, apparently due to uh, thawing or degraded permafrost underneath and uh, on poor management also. So this was in the news recently, and it's one of the biggest oil spills for the Arctic happening now. Uh, then you have an increase of natural hazards. You have changes in freshwater flows in the local environment and increased accessibility to the Arctic, for example, also enabled shipping, extractive industries development and more tourism. So now I switch to the first key question that we have to address in order to tackle this challenge. Um, so the first research question uh, is the, what are the key processes that are very specific to polar environment in the, in the climate system? First, you have polar land ice. Uh, there you have to consider the trade-off between surface mass balance and ice dynamics, which, uh, which uh, governs uh, uh, the fate of, the, of, the, of ice, of land ice. 
Uh, for that, we need to improve the understanding of mechanisms such as uh, glacial hydrology, glacier calving on ice discharge, discharge on marine ice sheet instability. Then we need to uh, think also about the permafrost, which is very specific to polar region. Uh, there you have terrain deformation and erosion in the Arctic, which remain to be studied extensively. You have feedback uh, uh, linked to permafrost extension and thawing, which is, uh, which is strongly which is a strong feedback with uh, carbon dioxide and methane release uh, when, uh, when carbon is mobilized. Um, then we identified also precipitation as an important topic. You have ch changing precipitation patterns and increasing temperature. It's influencing the snow cover in the northern hemisphere. It has also an impact with change in water runoff on river discharge. Continuing on this, uh, we identified also that atmosphere and clouds are important to study especially the physics and chemistry associated to polar cloud formation with a strong role of aerosol, for example. And boundary layer dynamics is also something uh, that is a, that a specific behavior in the Arctic. Sea ice on oceans, the sea ice deformation and distribution, and the linkage to rivering freshwater runoff. Uh, we need to study also the ocean circulation and physical structure at, at the various time scales. Uh, there is a challenge of sea ice cover on the marine glaciers and ice shelves. And finally, about the, uh, regarding the uh, uptake of, uh, of, CO, of, CO, of carbon dioxide, for example, the carbon pump on oceanic uptake of greenhouse gases through biogeochemical air sea interaction, where we have a lot of uh, uh, refinement to, uh, to investigate now. And finally, the human pressure on all this. Uh, so it has been initially, it was the human pressure was studied on the angle of uh, remote influence with transport from mid latitude forcings to the Arctic, for example, or Antarctic. And now we increasingly look at local anthrop anthropogenic pressure with the, with the recent development. And there is a, a combination of the two that has specific impact. Our second research uh, key question is uh, the, co uh, the coupling on feedback processes between the regional and global scale. So how, wh what is uh, to study better the link between the, what happened in the polar region and the, glo the global scale? So there we identified different family of uh, processes at the interfaces or within environmental components, more specialized, let's say. So at the interfaces, you have a variety of, uh, of challenges which are emerging, which are very important to study. Uh, there are several questions about air sea ice interactions, the interaction between oceanic water or sea ice and glaciers, about freshwater discharge on ocean stratification, uh, about land changes on the surface energy, energy budget, uh, which are at the interfaces. And then within the component, uh, we need also to look at more sp uh, specific aspects, like the impact of permafrost thaw on nutrient release from terrestrial to freshwater on marine ecosystems, uh, the impact of snow cover on carbon storage and release, uh, the impact of the marine biosphere on the biological carbon pump, etc. Continuing on this uh, question uh, two, um, we want to link the polar climate processes to the Earth system, uh, especially with, with looking at atmospheric and oceanic uh, long-range connections, long-range transport and currents so with their patterns on extreme sea level rise. Uh, we need to look carefully at the uh, impact of changes in polar ecosystem on lower latitude uh, from the perspective of the global carbon cycle, for example. Uh, comparative studies of the Arctic and Antarctic region, they, they are very interesting and they provide uh, additional information about the sensitivity of the polar regions to uh, climate changes. And we need to look at them on the, from the perspective of uh, climate and ecosystem services, because it's a, it's a common, let's say, the common currency that allows to look at the uh, climate uh, impact. Integrating and advancing knowledge of threshold uh, on the possibility of cascading tipping elements, for example, in the food webs. Our question 1.3 is about modeling. Uh, we want to improve the modeling on the ability to predict the polar climate system. So, of course, the models are used to make a future change projection, but also to explore predictability and guide, guide the design of observing systems. We need improvements in understanding of key physical processes that are necessary to reduce model error, uh, improve model skill. And there is a strong uh, uh, interest for the parameterization of critical subgrid scale processes. So basically below the resolution of the model, you have to uh, tell the model what to do. Uh, but you, so you can also increase resolution. But there are currently there are parameterizations strongly needed for uh, several boundary layer processes in the atmosphere and upper ocean. 
We need also to improve the interfaces between compartments uh, in, in models, so to allow for fully coupled representation of the Earth system. And you see for that the, in, the improvement in the co coupled climate models that are used in uh, IPCC re uh, reports. It's uh, always uh, being improved. We need to continue that and to look at the impact of, at the poles. Uh, and then for model evaluation, of course, you need uh, easy access to observations. You need more observations, you need new observations, and you need open access databases. And finally, we mentioned also the fact that uh, the, um, this is not specific to the pool, maybe, but this is still very important, that the Earth, syst uh, Earth system models uh, uh, are not yet uh, exascale ready for the new future platforms of computing. And then uh, the fourth question, the fourth and last question that we have, is to assess the impact of human activities on polar climate. So for that, we identify that uh, uh, if we want to have good adaptation and mitigation strategies, we need to have improved understanding about sources, processing, and fates of the different climate forces, uh, especially in the atmosphere, of course, but also in marine and terrestrial environments. <coughs> uh, we need to uh, look at local sources in the polar region, uh, linked, for example, to shipping, natural resource extraction, fishing, tourism, urbanization. Um, we also include in this discussion the uh, importance of pollution. So you have remote sources of pollution uh, that uh, sent to the polar region uh, contaminants such as uh, mercury, uh, disease, pops, persistent organic pollutants, or microplastics. Uh, you also can think about atmospheric pollution with uh, black carbon, and it's transported to the Arctic via, via atmospheric, terrestrial, and marine pathways, which require quantification. Finally, again, so I mentioned that already, there is a strong interplay of anthropogenic pressure on natural processes. Um, they, uh, to, uh, to disentangle these and to identify clearly the anthropogenic pressure, uh, we need to look at carefully also at the natural component. So there are climate-driven ecosystem changes that can also affect uh, uh, the sources of uh, greenhouse gases from natural sources such as uh, wetlands, uh, which, which are uh, a lot in, in Canada in, uh, and in Siberia, wildfires, or pollutant deposition. And finally, we cannot do this uh, without building on physical climate system knowledge and local and indigenous knowledge. So finally, uh, uh, summary of recommendations. Uh, so for a more accurate uh, understanding of the couple polar climate system, we need the uh, research and development, we need observatories, and we need international collaborations. We need to have a, a better enhanced and integrated observing systems that use existing on new environmental research infrastructure. So on the, uh, Europe is particularly uh, active in the field of uh, environmental research infrastructure, setting the pace uh, at, the, uh, at the larger scale. We need to engage not only with the research infrastructures that are currently at the pole, uh, operating at the, in the polar region, but also those which are not already there to encourage the development and extension of their networks towards the polar regions. We need new sensors that are adapted to the conditions of uh, the polar regions. We need near real-time transmission of data. We need a, a fair databases, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and I never remember the pair, unfortunately. Somebody will help me on that one. Um, but it's important to have data that can be shared and used uh, openly. And we need our system model development uh, that are adapted to these challenges. Of course, we need strong inter, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration within Europe and beyond. It's not a purely European challenge, but Europe can play a big role. Uh, we need international collaboration initiatives to be strengthened, uh, like SAON, the Arctic Council, IASC, Future Earth, etc. Not all of them are specifically polar. Uh, we need the networks of young scientists to be supported. And uh, I note that Europe should develop and reaffirm its leadership and further strengthen uh, excellence in this international initiative. So we wanted to propose uh, to tackle this uh, challenge in a more, uh, let's say, in a more uh, concrete way uh, uh, to discuss uh, the need for a polar observing decade. There is a lack of uh, medium long term record of glaciological, terrestrial, oceanic and atmospheric parameters, especially at the interfaces. Uh, many areas in Antarctic and Arctic are still unexplored because uh, it's too remote, too costly to access. Uh, there are critical interfaces that uh, remain poorly known. Uh, and uh, we need to make more measurements, especially where uh, communities live. So for that, there is a need for a coordinated European and international platform for decadal scale observation. The objective would be to uh, be understand better the processes of climate change in polar region and to enhance our ability to predict the impact from local to global scale. 
So for that, uh, it, uh, it would be interesting to, have to intensify our observation network uh, during 10 years. That would leave a very strong legacy for, for long-term observations, uh, but with a time-limited effort to collect new observation data. Uh, we need to uh, build upon existing national monitoring programs, uh, local community observation, the European uh, research infrastructure on integrating activities on space agency. So we need to enhance the development, validation and assimilation in Earth system models, uh, of course, that would be the, the uh, integration of the new knowledge uh, on improvement of prediction. We need to collect new paleoclimate data to understand the polar region uh, in context at longer time scales. Uh, and uh, it should provide a good data foundation for decades of future research. This will allow understanding how climate change in the polar region will influence global climate on living conditions for both Arctic communities and the population at lower latitudes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean Daniel. Um, I, I see there are uh, several questions um, here, but I, since we are running a bit out of time, we will collect them and we will post them to you later on, either after these three presentations or after all the presentations. And I suggest that we move on. Um, the next uh, talk is on research needs two, which is informed weather and climate action. And it will be presented by uh, Johnny Jonassen from the um, Nansen Environmental and Remote Sensing Center in Norway and Torben Christensen from Aarhus University. Both are the lead authors. And I think, Johnny, are you there? Can you take over? Yes, I'm here. And, and I will now start to share my screen. Can you see it? Are you able to see the screen? Yes, we are able. OK, very good. So thanks and good morning to everyone. Um, I will present the uh, uh, achievement that has been uh, derived on a research need to inform weather and climate action. Okay, so the lead authors on this chapter or, or were Tobin Röhe, Christensen and uh, myself. Torben, he is unfortunately not able to join us today. And we had participation from Michael Sparrow, Colin Stadmont, Christine schutt Biedberg, Jon Christiansen, Daniela Ligat, Paolo Rutti, and Søren Risko. So the um, startup on this issue is that science has the duty and responsibility to inform society of the different trajectories of environmental changes in the polar regions and their social, cultural, economic, geopolitical, and environmental implications. The research needs that we are targeting, therefore, has to be tailored to the understanding of the current status and the possibilities to predict the future changes in the polar regions, to allow for near and far field societal adaptations. Engage constructively and effectively with policymakers, as well as local polar communities at all stages of the research, with a focus on the existing and likely future threats to polar ecosystems, stakeholders and right holders. Identify available sources for environmental and socioeconomic data that are needed to assess systematic impacts upon Arctic and Antarctic environments, as well as related human activities. Identify gaps in knowledge and initiate or enhance monitoring activities to strengthen future predictions of environmental impacts, feedbacks, and trends in the polar regions. At policy relevant spatial and temporal scales, integrate available environmental and societal knowledge to develop a suite of future scenarios. Four key uh, questions is therefore arising. Number one, identifying relevant indicators of polar climate change. It's clear that this one particularly is strongly linked to uh, research needs number one, just presented by uh, Sean Dan Dania. 
Key research question two, design new approaches to test the chain of processes from climate indicators to decision making. Key question three, supporting the decision making through prediction and projection of polar climate and socio-ecological systems. And key question four, assessing the added value of the polar regions in relations to climate change and human activity impacts. For key question number one, um, identifying relevant indicators of polar climate change, the starting point for us here are the global cycles of water, carbon and energy. There is a massive need to, uh, to advance the quantitative understanding and interactions of these three distinct cycles and not at least how the anthropogenic impact on these cycles uh, has evolved. Uh, one can't do the global without having the opportunity to precisely understand them and quantify them regionally. And the Arctic, the polar regions, both uh, Arctic and Antarctic, are strongly uh, uh, distinct regional aspects in the context of these cycles. So the colors inside each of these, um, in these figures, is connectivity between the cycles. So the blue color, light blue colors are connected, the um, brown colors are connected, and uh, the um, uh, gray-blue colors are connected. And hence, therefore, these three cycles do in fact interact also very strongly. We can put this back onto the map of indicators. And this is an ongoing activity which is emerging in the communities um, and coming out of GCOS and WCRP as well. And uh, currently, some of these have been um, identified in, associated with, with the temperature and energy, atmospheric composition, ocean and water, cryosphere, terrestrial phenology and extremes. And keep in mind that these are, can all be placed directly back to these three um, uh, cycles that I mentioned. And we can then connect to these the distinct parameters um, and variables um, that is particularly relevant for each of these uh, indicators. And I don't go through this list, and it may not be as well um, um, complete as it stands now. It needs to be refined. But it is important again to recognize that the essential climate variables has also been um, achieved through an enormous effort in the communities. And therefore, we have to bring this back to the picture associated the ECVs with the indicators. And this is another example of this, where we are emphasizing those most direct uh, ECVs to indicate our linkages, but there is still room for um, refinement of this as well. Key question two, designing new approaches to test the chain of processes from climate indicators to decision making. Here we illustrate this through an coordinated efforts that will require a long time series observations. This is completely in consistency and agreement with what was presented by uh, Sean Daniel. So um, <clears throat> long time series are needed to serve the purpose of studying scientific questions related to changes of the coastal landscape and impacts of ocean freshening in in terms of marine ecosystems, for instance. And again, it will also have implications for shift in the atmospheric exchanges of greenhouse gases. And geographically, in the case of the high latitude seas and the Arctic Ocean, there is an illustration of how we think this in a, a coordinated framework. So a north-south gradient along the coast of Greenland, for instance, will capture landscape changes as well as changes in the ocean and would allow us to have a better grip on this uh, dynamic interaction which is expected to evolve even further uh, from the retreat of the Greenland ice sheet and the consequences for the coastal landscape and the, the neighboring oceans. Also, we do uh, have to invest more into the interaction of the Arctic uh, with the uh, North Atlantic, and uh, there are opportunities to find uh, um, transects that can be benefiting uh, that particular 
um, uh, research question as well. And lastly, inside the Arctic, of course, um, from the central part of the Arctic towards the Arctic uh, marginal uh, ice zones, there are also distinct needs to have more systematic observations. You can imagine that the mosaic, which has been undertaken uh, this last uh, winter, um, well, could we do that every year over a 10 year period? Uh, it's a question that we need to pose into the uh, attempt to design an observing system that can be relevant and provide observations across the Earth system. There is also an insert up in the left um, um, part of this picture, which illustrates a similar kind of view of a uh, transect uh, regional area of importance in Antarctica, which is along the Antarctic Peninsula. Key question three, supporting decision-making through predictions and projections of polar climate and socio-ecological system. While the data products and services should be disseminated and co-produced through iteratively and interactively processes aiming to increase the user capacity to responsibly use tailored services and actionable information. Despite improvements in Arctic and Antarctic forecasting skills in recent decades, existing numerical weather predictions and coupled global climate projections do not fully meet uh, the demand um, associated with the use of requirements. And it's also fair to say that recently there has been a strong uh, push uh, with the view of uh, the CMIP runs and how valuable the CMIP runs have been. And the preliminary conclusion is that the CMIP uh, runs up to now do not meet the expectations of the users. Large amounts of satellite observations and model forecasts are available from Copernicus and governmental services in real time. However, the uptake by users is limited by the expertise to handle and interpret the data and information products and by the low bandwidth limitations of satellite communications that exist in the high latitude um, uh, polar regions, both with regards to um, ship operations as well as practices on, uh, on land. So novel approaches to adopt to low bandwidth requirements in polar regions will be needed jointly with better visualization system to provide the multitude of information from in situ measurement satellites and forecasting systems in real time and in offline mode, both for operators in Arctic and Antarctic. The interdisciplinarity and co-production approaches involving natural and societal sciences, as well as public and commercial users, are still uh, not at the level of satisfaction and should be advocated strongly and initiated better. Key question 2.4. Assessing the added value of the polar regions in relation to climate change and human activity impacts. The added values, when discussing the value of the polar regions, we should be aware that this term comprises both extrinsic values, those that are means to an and, and include economic and resource values and intrinsic values which describe aspects of the regions that are valued in and of themselves, such as wilderness and aesthetic beauty. Early warming in a warming climate um, is basically the canary in the coal mine. The significance of the polar regions as barometers for global change, as well as significant moderating forces e.g. drivers of thermal and circulation through the production of coal dense bottom water and the Earth's largest frozen freshwater stores cannot be overemphasized in this context. But at the same time, global temperature change is amplified in the polar regions, especially in the Arctic, where the impact of climate change has consequences not only for the local environments and populations, but also on the low latitudes through global teleconnections. Again, what we also heard from uh, research, need present, research need number one presentations. The human activity impact, while increased human activities in polar regions are generating local and global impacts. In the Arctic, for instance, these come from increased tourism, 
transport and activities aimed at securing both finite and renewable natural resources. In the Antarctic area, they arise from increased human presence through expanding tourism, fisheries, and research activities, including the establishment of additional research stations and infrastructure on the Antarctic continent. In the Arctic, moreover, reductions in sea ice promise to open new sea ice routes that must be managed to ensure that networks of marine protected areas are preserved and protected. And in all instances, both the lack and the construction of infrastructure for long-term and transient human presence present additional challenges. Summary and recommendations. In order to improve the knowledge base for decision-making in relation to better informed weather and climate action, a set of international efforts are needed. Transect-based coordinated large-scale targeted programs. These should take advantage of shared logistics and organizations for answering key scientific questions in relation to, for example, space for time replacement of ecosystem processes and increased runoff of coastal waters uh, uh, from um, coastal, <laughs> increased runoff uh, to coastal areas from melting land ice and ice sheets, and so leading to a freshening of the ocean. New technologies should be deployed. These should be in, in the form of autonomous platform carried sensors, autonomous distributed sampling hubs, increased use of emerging remote sensing capabilities, advances in bandwidth capacity, and um, so on. In this, there is also, well, this is also addressed in research need number six. Existing long time series of ecosystem monitoring data. These data should be utilized to their maximum and expand with greater spatial coverage using mobile comparative and complementary measurement platforms. New model development and innovative approaches at a variety of scales from processes to regional climate prediction, models, data assimilation, machine learning and artificial intelligence should be applied and developed in close conjunction with the improved measurement capabilities as well as through use of emerging long-term observational data set for validation. Educational aspects. These need to be included at all levels, both in the form of internal exchange between researchers and technicians involved and beyond the project with educational and training programs for both schools and the wider public to be developed in concert with the research efforts. And finally, commercial, industrial and social development. There is a need for collaboration between academia, indigenous organizations, local communities, government and industries to enhance technology development, new jobs, safer operations, but the sustainable economies, including transport, fisheries and industry and capacity for building in, uh, in polar regions. That's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ani. Um, um, as I said before, we will directly move on to the next presentation to keep a bit the schedule. And um, I would now like to ask uh, Doris Abele from the Alfred Wiener Institute in uh, Germany uh, to present research need number three. Hi, Doris. Resilience is your ecological system. Doris, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicole. I hope you can hear me. Yes. And I will now share the presentation. It works. It works. And um, switch off my camera here. Um, we'll just go through it. Um, started on the wrong end. Here. So, uh, people are loading things up in my drop boxes. So, uh, so I hope you can hear me all right. And yes, I'm, I'm presenting research need three. So how to come to resilient socio-ecological 
uh, systems in the polar regions. And before I start, I would like to present my, my co-authors and collaborators here. Uh, so Justina Dahl uh, for socio-ecological sciences and politics in the polar regions. Michael Zier is an Arctic uh, ecologist and uh, so we were a good team because he works in uh, purely change in the Arctic and I work in similar things in the Antarctic. Then there was uh, Birgitta Evengard and Arya Rautzu for the very important part of uh, humanities, uh, human health and community health in the Arctic and the Antarctic and the concept of one health that will be presented later. Uh, and Vera Hausner, um, specialist for ecosystem-based management, Timo Kovrova for a law and governance in the uh, polar region. And uh, when we talk about, uh, the, or we all know about the polar ecosystems and their extreme vulnerability to climate change and human impact from the glaciers to the little bivalves in the sediments. Uh, but when we talk about socio-ecological systems, we need to look at both the ecosystems and the so societies that depend on them and also tackle the, the links and uh, connections between the two. And uh, any, uh, so, so any program uh, from the EU bringing on the future research on socio-ecological systems needs to include uh, investigative science in both of these compartments, but also consider the links and connections between the two and um, evaluate um, ecosystem-based management activities and also the transformative processes for, to, to, to come to really resilient management of these uh, sensitive uh, ecoregions. Um, so with the group, we started out defining knowledge gaps. Um, oops. Back. The, the knowledge gaps uh, that we see. And uh, so, and, and, and then pave the way of, of, to the program. Um, so we need to expand the observational capacities to better understand the polar ecosystem structure and functioning and link polar ecosystem change to the Arctic, but also to global human uh, health and well-being. We need to improve observational strategies and develop analytical, uh, develop the spatial analytical capacities that we have in the polar ecosystems. We need to definitely further develop ecosystem-based management for polar socio-ecological systems. And we also always need to assess and analyze the response of societies to socio-ecological system change uh, more adaptable and, and come to uh, societally acceptable transformative processes. I put this uh, slide in just to remind me to highlight the difference between uh, both polar regions in terms of the, the historical colonization of the Arctic, that we need to link here the ecosystem change to health and well-being, primarily of the Arctic populations, their, their community, identity, their uh, quality of life, livelihood, and uh, economy structures. Whereas the Arctic, we, we of course have no population, but there is a fundamental service that the Arctic provides to the global community, thinking of climate change, carbon storage and sequestration, which needs to be further investigated. Uh, freshwater, the biggest freshwater storage on Earth that we cannot touch in any way. And biodiversity maintenance in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, and I've put down here a photo of a beaching krill swarm to illustrate that in front of a melting glacier. And these animals were dying on the beach in the Antarctic because they had ingested the sediments uh, coming from this melting and retreating glacier. So just to illustrate these connections. Now uh, to the research questions. Research question one. 
uh, polar ecosystem structure and functioning, how to better understand that. We need to expand the spatial observation, the spatial ecology and spatial observation of these ecosystems to address energy and matter fluxes across system boundaries. So between land, sea and atmosphere systems, but also with adjacent areas, the subpolar areas and globally. And we also need to include hard to access areas. So we have to go out of our comfort zones and our, uh, around our research stations and uh, the projects that we, we have in the terrestrial realm and the, the marine realm, and, and also go into the areas which are harder to access. And when we talk about uh, transport processes, this uh, essentially includes also the, the living component, so migrating species, invasive species, and uh, Neobiota have become a burning issue in the Antarctic and also in the Arctic. And we need to test the response of the polar, the indigenous polar species and the uh, biological community to these invasions. And um, also then in combination uh, with other human impacts. Just think of blue mussels now settling in uh, King George Island. Uh, what e effect does that have on the local ecosystem? How to design healthy socio-ecological systems? Here we need to develop new indicators for uh, the one health questions that really uh, look at the links between ecosystems and societies. So uh, indicators for water, environmental food security, energy provision, human and wildlife health. And we, we importantly need to strengthen the community participation in, and involvement in study design and monitoring. So citizen science, if you will, and also include indigenous knowledge because otherwise we're losing fundamental information. Um, about observation of socio-ecological systems, here we discussed that we, we, we need to establish observational networks that integrate across uh, our moorings and uh, measuring systems that we have in some places, but then we need cruises and repeat surveys in other areas to bind parameters together uh, and to operate on different levels of system complexity uh, so that these networks enable us to homogenize the data across um, areas of different temporal and spatial complexity. So just think about working in polar or fjordic areas. You have high data density in these areas, but then how to connect it to the shelf regions and to the deep sea or on the other side to the the larger plains or tundras, where you may have one data point every 500 kilometers. How to homogenize these data? What do you need? That's a very important question to address these ecosystems. Um, we also need to standardize data processing for polar regions and improve uh, data management and storage and develop information systems for sort of data in and out. Uh, making this data more accessible. And uh, while doing that, we, we still need to, to keep in mind that we have personalized hum humanity data that needs special requirements for data management and security. Ecosystem-based management and governance in the future uh, needs to continue to analyze the drivers of current ecosystem change to define parameter baselines and feedback loops and stress thresholds, uh, tipping points to prepare for rapid uh, changes in the polar socio-ecological systems. And importantly, we need to address here uncertainties and prepare for sudden change uh, by developing instruments for application of precautionary measures and principles. We need uh, to expand scenario methodology and adaptive governance. I'm not reading through all of this, but just highlighting the major points here. 
so then finally, uh, key question five, how do we analyze the response of socio-ecological of, of societies to socio-ecological changes and transformation? It's really important to create um, plausible uh, future tra trajectories about these system systems that are transmittable to societies and allow for effective uh, adaptation and decision taking. And it is important to analyze the perceptions of the values and risks of these transformation in the population with the people and co-design the research, co-develop sustainable pathways with Arctic indigenous and local people to reach transformations that are then socially licensed and, and, and culturally working and acceptable. Yeah, and when it comes to economy, it would help to strengthen agent-based simulations, transformative solutions, uh, agent-based simulations, choice modeling or process control modeling, however you name it, um, uh, to, to, to come to uh, the best and cost-effective way forwards to prepare for uh, and adapt to change. Summary and recommendations. Um, so basically, we need to still improve the baseline knowledge of biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in both polar regions. That's fundamental. And specifically, also, we need to develop the molecular tools and techniques to investigate these systems, monitor these systems, and modeling to, to, to predict and predict the consequences of change. We need to strengthen the participation of the communities and interest groups in study design and in, uh, yeah, involve them in major research activities from the beginning on and throughout. And I found it a very interesting suggestion of Birgitta that uh, artificial intelligence could potentially become an important tool for the integration of huge and very, very diverse databases, databases on human health in the Arctic which are currently not harmonized and therefore not really applicable uh, to research. And with this, I thank you and uh, yes, uh, hope to take your questions later. Thank you very much Doris uh, for this nice presentation and for sticking to the time. Um, I would suggest that we will now make a very, very short break. So we were supposed to have a break at 11.15. Uh, <laughs> Everybody of us needs to have a short health break. And then we will continue <clears throat> in, I would say, 10 minutes. So from now on, five minutes after 11.35, uh, with the second half of the panel. And then uh, we will we note it down all questions and then we will ask you directly the questions afterwards in the discussion round. So please stay on here now. Use the five minutes or the ten minutes we have uh, to get something, a coffee or whatever you need. And we will start again at 11.35 with the second half of this meeting. Thank you.
So um, welcome back, everybody. Um, at least my clock here at the computer says it's five minutes past. So we will continue now with the next three research needs to be presented for the Integrated European Polar Research Program. We will start with research need four, prospering communities in the Arctic. And the lead authors of uh, and presenters of these research needs are Peter Schweitzer from the University of Vienna in Austria and Halvor Danewig from the Western Norway Research Institute. Um, Peter or Halvor, can you please start? Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Nico, for the introduction. Uh, can you see the video? I, I mean, yes. the, the PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Then um, I will start. Um, my colleague Halvor Danewig will then take over in the second half of the presentation. Um, our focus is on communities. And as you can see, um, while this is a, uh, about the European Polar Research Program, we primarily focus on the Arctic. There are, in the written text, there are a few references to the Antarctic, but by and large, we are talking about the Arctic because we are talking about human communities. And as we all know, there might be temporary human communities in the Antarctic, but no uh, <clears throat> long-term settlements, at least not with a uh, a, a long-term cultural history. Um, so the focus on, on communities has to do that most of the most of the authors, and let me actually advance to the next slide, um, and collaborators of this of this research need are social scientists. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we believe that that one important dimension of any polar program really is to focus on the local and regional levels, on the subnational levels. So while we all agree that there, is, there are important um, <clears throat> national and global interests in the Arctic, whether they are economic or geopolitical, we also strongly believe that what it's all about in the end, in terms of human communities, is the people who live there. So the local residents of the Arctic, whether they're indigenous or non-indigenous. So the, the goal of having prospering human communities in the Arctic is central. In terms of the, our collaborators, as I indicated, um, you know, we have like Doug Avango here uh, <clears throat> from an um, history of science SDS perspective, Timothy Heleniak from an <clears throat> economic geography and demography perspective, Diane Hirschberg from Alaska as an education specialist. But we also have Thomas Ing Ingemann Nielsen, who is an engineer. And um, <clears throat> I think all of the chapters have a certain level of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. And for us, this is an important dimension here to cross um, this linkage between built environments and social environments, but of course also natural environments. With that, let me go straight into our um, uh, chapter itself or the, the research need um, number four. So the, the, the reason why we ended up with focusing on communities has to do also with the extreme heterogeneity of the Arctic. Um, especially when you go to the, to the subnational level, you see an enormous complexity of histories, of, of cultural histories, of economic system, of religious systems, etc., which can both, which can best uh, address and access on this community level. At the same time, we do not want to create the impression that communities is something um, unified or homogeneous, not at all. So communities themselves, of course, consist of, of, different, of, of different subgroups. And so the intersectionality of, of age groups, of gender, of, um, of ethnicity, etc., is important if we talk about communities. And, and we focus here in the introduction slide also on the importance of, of uh, education, meaning that it's also very much about the future, about future generations. So one, once again, the focus of research need um, number four is the community. Um, what are the societal challenges, <coughs> excuse me, and needs um, that we are addressing here? So first and foremost, we, 
you know, in, in the end, it's all about um, improved well-being and quality of life. Um, that's clear, but we need to link that to other parameters and especially also in terms of improved and stronger local participation, self-determination, indigenous and non-indigenous local participation, and governance, etc. So <clears throat> we, need to, we, we need to understand which of these factors um, are important here. Um, thus, we need indicators, indicators for well-being and sustainable development in the Arctic. And um, of course, no society, um, first of all, no society is an island. I, I really want to, to, to add that here while we focus on communities where we are well aware of the fact that every community in this world is also connected to the outside world, to global and national um, networks. But, but we, we also want to think about um, regional economic development models as every community also needs to have make a living. And, um, and finally, the just transition in terms of, of um, emissions and energy solutions, which is, a, which is a global challenge, is of course also a very important one for Arctic communities. Um, now to the key questions, I would say we, we, we have seven key questions, but uh, they are probably better defined as domains, as knowledge domains, which very strongly come out of this stakeholder input that was earlier mentioned by, by Marie Noel. Um, so one of them um, would be infrastructure. And while you see here an aspect of transportation infrastructure on, on this photograph here, uh, infrastructure is of course much more, whether it's a hospital or water and sewage systems, etc., or the, uh, the diesel tank that was mentioned in the first presentation, um, the diesel tank that, that, um, that leaked uh, near Norilsk a couple of days ago. Uh, so infrastructure is an extremely important um, aspect um, and, and very often infrastructures are built by outside interests, um, by outside money certainly, um, and, and it's, it's important here really to have this connection between community needs and, and, and um, local conditions and, um, and, and, and the mechanism for, for building that. There is also this dimension beyond the purely technological and physical dimension of how basically having the knowledge to operate and maintain infrastructure systems. So it's not enough to build something, you also need to have local um, capacity to keep it up. So I'm not going to read um, what, what is written on the slide. Um, you can hopefully read that um, yourself. And in the interest of time, I want to move on to the next key question. It's not a problem that we cannot count. So Halgo and I are able to count, but we are jumping here from key question 4.1 to key question 4.5, because the ones in between, but two, three, and four will be presented by Halgo in a minute. Learning from the past is really one aspect that was very strongly highlighted in the stakeholder input. So we took that from there um, straight end. And on this slide, it's maybe presented more in terms of the industrial heritage of, of, um, of, of the Arctic. But of course, learning from the past, learning the lessons from the past, the good and the bad, is of course not limited to the industrial and, and uh, resource extraction heritage of the Arctic or Antarctic for that matter. So uh, it is very important that we, that we critically look um, at the past, so a critical historical analysis in order to have better futures. Next uh, issue, demography. There is, it's, it's obvious, it should be obvious that, that um, Arctic communities can only, um, can only prosper under certain demographic uh, conditions. If there is too few or too, um, too many people, if there is a, a skewed age or gender balance, so, 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 there, there are, so it's, it's about, uh, about a, good, um, a good balance in the population. And there are, of course, a, a number of non-demographic factors such as climate change that come into play here. And of course, in and out migration, uh, whether you know the, suddenly with global warming, the, 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 you know there are some people who fear that that people from 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 the south will will flood the north. It hasn't really been happening so far, but that's something to look at. But at the same time, also 
are people from the north moving south in search of economic and other opportunities. Um, and finally, cultural vitality. So culture for us um, is, um, has, a, has a number of dimensions. Not only does it include um, singing, dancing, and, 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 and other dimensions of the arts, but also religion, language, etc. And we want to make sure that we are uh, that the, under cultural vitality is understood both keeping the old but also creating the new. So cultural revitalization and cultural innovation go hand in hand. So this image here is more on revitalization. Well, you know, you could um, bring examples of Inuit hip hop um, groups or so uh, in terms of, of cultural innovation. But of course, also here we are not limiting our analysis to to um, indigenous groups, so it's all for all um, residents of the Arctic, whether they're settler communities or indigenous communities. The internet intersectionality was already mentioned, um, how important it is, also the commercial and non-commercial dimensions of culture. And finally, uh, we also need here more indicators of cultural vitality. With that, I would like to give the word to Halvor. Thank you, Peter. Um... Uh, yeah, as you know, the, the Arctic is uh, governed by a number of different uh, institutional arrangements at multiple scales, from the local municipal council to the uh, international treaties governing the, 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 the seas, for instance. And, uh, but we, we will, uh, in this, uh, this chapter, we have been focusing on mostly on the subnational level. Um, the um, small size of most communities and uh, a colonial history in many places implies a marginal position of many Arctic uh, residents uh, towards the, the national government. government. But um, the recent decades have seen um, uh, the evolution of power and increased autonomy at, uh, at at least the regional level, uh, perhaps maybe not in, in, so in, in Russia. Uh, also, we have seen establishing of uh, separate political institutions for indigenous groups. Uh, this has also led to overlapping governance stru structure, which strain capacity of inhabitants to participate in political processes. So we need more knowledge and a better understanding about how we can ensure that governance system foster greater participation while growing self-determination and legal empowerment. Also, we need uh, more knowledge about how uh, economic benefits from the increased economic activity can be... Uh, no, please stay at the, 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 the former slide, please. Uh, um, uh, can, we need to know how we can find the optimal balance between uh, increased economic activity and cultural and environmental protection and how we ensure local participation in this management. N next please. Uh, we uh, at recently the Arctic uh, local economies have tend to be based on just a few industries. Uh, which makes them vulnerable uh, to global changes in demand. Uh, retreating sea ice uh, allows us for increased uh, maritime traffic and new uh, tech-based and service-based industries and tourism, not least, is now of increased importance. We need a better understanding of how we can uh, balance this uh, the, or the need for increased economic activity locally uh, against its negative impacts uh, and ensure local value creation also from the outside driven uh, increased activity. Uh, we need uh, also a better understanding of the, the, the relationship between subsistence activities and industrial activities and uh, particularly uh, in terms of food security and availability of traditional foods and also how climate change impacts this relationship. Uh, there is also a lack of uh, adequate uh, indicators for measuring well-being and local economic development in the Arctic, which this is not well captured by the SDGs. 
So we need uh, uh, therefore a new set of, of indicators that does this. Next slide, please. Uh, the role of education and knowledge transfer in supporting adaptation and sustainability in the face of the rapid social and economic change is not well explored. This is urgent in the Arctic as elsewhere. Um, and uh, we, um, we need to know how we can enable Arctic residents to cope with this, uh, these changes and also to ensure greater well-being. Uh, there's a brain drain and, and a loss of human capital in many Arctic communities and we need to know also to know why youth are dropping out for formal schooling and this is a particular concern in many indigenous communities and also why young people choose to leave northern communities. Finally, many scholars and indigenous leaders in the Arctic argue for more fish effective education systems that balance uh, in or that integrate Western scientific knowledge with uh, traditional uh, and indigenous knowledge. But we need more knowledge about how we do this well. Uh, final slide, please. Um, do we, we, um, for all the above mentioned research needs, we, we need a co-production of knowledge approach uh, with the um, the appropriate participatory methods. Um, we also need uh, a resolution mechanism for conflicting data management regimes uh, and uh, particularly with all the new di digital ways of, of being connected there's uh, an acute need of resolving data sharing and privacy issues. Um, also there's a need to, uh, to what should I say, making the recent Arctic Council agreement on scientific cooperation operationable and this particularly concern access to the Russian Arctic, uh, but also access to um, social science registries and statistics in the different countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Peter and Halvo, <laughs> uh, for this nice presentation. We will move immediately on and then discuss everything at the end. So I will give the floor now to research need number five, which is challenges and opportunities of polar operations. And it will be presented by Birgit Njerstad from the North Polar Institute in Norway and Christine Valentin from the World Ocean Council, which is based with the European node is based in France and the US, uh, the international node is based in US from the World Ocean Council. I think Christine obviously starts because I see her face, so it's the floor, your floor, Christine. Okay, thank you, uh, Nicole, for this presentation. And uh, I will start by putting the presentation on here. Okay. So, uh, I am very happy with uh, Birgit uh, to present to you research uh, need five. So the overarching objective of research need five is to provide the EU with a framework for research that aims to increase knowledge required to underpin safe, sustainable and just operations in the polar regions in long term. So to start with, you may wonder when we talk about operations, what we talk about. So operations refer to a broad range of activities in the polar regions, including commercial operations, such as oil and gas production, mines, shipping, tourism, but also non-commercial operations, such as government operations, search and rescue, coast guard, and research operations. Now the work on chapter five was done with a team that includes Annette Skipstra, Vito Vitale, Odjarl Borg, Sveining Lusset, and without them, we would not have been able to do uh, uh, what we have, what we will present, Birgit and I. Sustainable economic growth can stimulate job creation, increase the use of environmentally efficient technologies and provide innovative solutions to developmental challenges in the region. At the same time, 
It is important to understand that economic growth will lead to new pressures on society that can challenge the sustainability of these communities and societies. In the Arctic, there is a need to create more jobs and to develop a broader economic platform for the communities. In addition, the Arctic is of growing interest to shipping and tourism and also resource exploitation. Antarctica, in contrast, does not host any indigenous or permanent populations and settlements, as you have already heard. While conditions in Antarctica will continue to be a limiting factor, new technologies will enable operations to evolve and expand. Furthermore, research and tourism operations have generally taken place in the most productive and vulnerable areas of Antarctica. Ensuring safe, sustainable, and just operations in the polar regions has both region-specific and global societal relevance. Regionally, the challenges are vast and require economic development in a unique and changing environment, as well as the sustenance of existing activities and society. Therefore, and as you can see on this slide, improved knowledge and understanding of operations in the polar environment requires research in the areas of the effects of operations on natural and social environments, the importance of local, regional, and global factors, the environmental, technical, and societal factors, methodologies and procedures, and the enabling elements for the development of a circular economy. Birgit? Yes, thank you. So, um, uh, hello everybody. I will be presenting a couple of the key uh, questions from uh, Research Need 5. Uh, and I'll start with the first one, uh, which is about uh, understanding how changes in the environment and changes, changes in the operations will impact the level of risk and the environmental vulnerab vulnerabilities. Just to summarize uh, quite short, uh, there is little doubt that climate change, as well as improved infrastructure and technology um, or technological developments, have made and will continue to make the polar regions more accessible. More activity in northern and southern waters, even further north and further south than today, will increasingly expose maritime operations to cold climate, ice and icing, darkness, potential icebergs, and atmospheric communi communication and navigation disturbances, to mention some of the issues. On land, climate-related changes such as permafrost thawing, we heard about that earlier today, landslides and coastal erosions, amongst other, have a potential to impact operational infrastructures, such as oil and gas pipelines and not the least tanks, again, referring to the example that have, we have seen a couple of times today. All these uh, changes uh, influence operational risk, uh, and mostly, I would say, in a negative direction. And therefore, challenges uh, are aimed to conduct safe and sustainable uh, operations. For this purpose, it is necessary to understand how, when, and where environmental and operational changes impact risk. We need to develop technology and operational frameworks that mitigate such risks. And we need to understand what responses will work when undesired events occur. And I think that summarizes uh, key question one in a, in a nutshell, and more is to be read, of course, in, um, in the document. So our second key question is about minimizing environmental impacts for, from operations. Understanding the potential impacts that may arise from various types of operations will enable society as a next step to identify, develop, and implement technological, spatial, temporal, regulatory actions that reduce and minimize these impacts. To ensure realistic assessments of impacts arising from polar operations, it is fundamentally important that our basic understanding of the polar region's environment and ecosystem is improved considerably. It is also important that we continue to work to reduce uncertainties in future climate scenarios to better constrain those impacts realistically. And we've heard about both the 
need for um, understanding of the ecosystem and the climate um, scenarios, to say, so to speak, uh, in earlier presentations, particularly research need one and research need three. While we need to more, more about impacts in general, <clears throat> there are certain pressures that have specific particularities in the polar region and for which there still are large knowledge gaps that need to be filled. These require special attention and we have, as you will see on the screen, identified some of these, um, um, uh, these uh, pr uh, special pressures. And I believe some of them were discussed earlier uh, as well, in particular the invasive uh, alien species issues. All in all, <clears throat> we need to increase knowledge about the vulnerabilities in the environment and to understand the resilience of the system. And on this basis, study what actions and technologies can minimize negative impacts caused by polar operations. And then I leave the floor to... Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Birgit. And so I will continue with question uh, number three. And uh, in order to introduce that question, uh, we'll just uh, give a sh short introduction. Climate change, globalization, and the desire for industries that are more sustainable are the main drivers for changing operations in the polar regions. These changing and increasing operations involve and affect many different stakeholders in different ways. Thus, we identified as a key question the definition of a social license to operate, what is mentioned as SLO, for polar operations and the means to promote it. I will explain a bit what SLO is because I'm not sure everybody understands or knows um, the notion, the concept. SLO relates to the social risks of an activity, the ongoing acceptance and or approval of an activity or a decision by local communities and other stakeholders that can affect its profitability. Trust building is regarded as central to obtaining a social license to operate something which is created and maintained slowly over time. SLO can help in dealing with some of the challenges to sustainable development, such as the role of communities in development trajectories, increasing expectations on industries, unequal power relations between stakeholder groups, the complexity of building trust-based, meaningful, and lasting relationships between stakeholders, and the challenge of finding a common language and approach among stakeholder groups. SLO might also play a role in social justice considerations. Due to the particulars of the polar regions, there is considerable need to explore and understand the concept of social license to operate and social justice in the context of these regions as well as location-specific issues related to the implementation of these concepts. And our last question around policies, frameworks, and governments and governance ensuring safe, sustainable, and just operations. As you all know, the polar regions are gaining increasing political and economic significance. At the same time, Climate and environmental changes and increased economic activity are setting established administrative regimes under pressure. All stakeholders have a role in providing the framework for movement of goods, knowledge and people, and understanding these factors is of importance. There is therefore a need for research-based understanding that can support further developments and discussions relating to policy, and governance aspects around the following. Mapping of stakeholders, identification of new challenges related to new operations, resolving of the administrative challenges linked to increased interest in resource extraction operations in the Arctic, focus on the protection status of the regions and the limitations in operations related to different types of activities, inclusive of environment and welfare of local communities operational demands and needs for regulations, both on land, air, and sea, covering areas such as design, construction, equipment, 
operational training, search and rescue, and environmental protection matters. Also, shortfalls created by the lack of, of, of observations mentioned in chapters one and two, compounded by the lack of universal access to data, hinder the formulation of innovative strategies for managing social and environmental changes in the Arctic and beyond. Interoperability and exploitation of distributed data will provide useful information in a collective sense for science, society, industry, and operations in polar regions. And now, Birgit, for the summary of recommendations. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. It's a ping pong uh, play here. Thank you very much. So we hope that uh, through this brief presentation, which we have, of course, discussed more extensively in the research program itself, we have made the case for the need for an expansive, creative and directed research effort in order to secure a solid and substantial knowledge basis for responsible, safe and sustainable operations in the polar regions in the future. Minimizing the negative societal and environmental footprint of operations in the changing Arctic and Antarctic, while at the same time benefiting from the opportunities these changes provide, requires research and development on many levels and across disciplines, both in the natural and societal sciences, as well as in the technological realm. We believe that this is an area of research that will benefit immensely by close collaboration between academia, operators, industries and other stakeholders throughout, and by also engaging the operators actively in the collation of knowledge. New technologies will play an important role in conducting the research, and the development of appropriate technology for this purpose may indeed also be a research focus in itself. We believe it would be beneficial to provide a dedicated framework to ensure that, that relevant knowledge and research is available and utilized to support the further quest for knowledge supporting robust polar operations. And with this, um, both Christine and I thank you for your attention and we look forward to the questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much. A very nice presentation. Um, we will now move on to the next one. Tina is already there. So the last uh, research need is to be is called inclusive creation, access and usage of knowledge. It will be presented by Tina Skolmeister from Grit Arendal in Norway and the second lead author is Giovanni Masseloni from CNR, the Italian Research Council. So Tina, it's your turn. Yes, um, does that work? Not yet. Yes, it works. And um, I do not see you anymore. No, I... it's not the presenter view, right? No, it's okay. You can start. Okay, yes. So thank you, Nicole, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I uh, will uh, I indeed did not do all the work alone. Um, this is really weird. I, I'm sorry, but I don't see the... Uh, you should start the presentation, so we... Yes. Could you please go in presentation mode? It was, but not anymore. Yes, now it, ah, is. There it is. Yes, sorry about that. Yes, so uh, <laughs> welcome everybody. And I was already here where I wanted to uh, indeed uh, present the rest of the team that work together on this. Um, I will be the only one talking today but uh, Giovanni is uh, present and he was the co-lead of this team and neither of us would have been able to do it uh, on our own as well without the rest of the of the people that are listed here which is Ger Gertrude Saxinger, Gonzalo Vieira, Katrine Jonsson, Kirsi Latula, Marta Terrado, Wolfgang Schöner and Eustein Godai. So we were a good international uh, team collaboration um, from nine different institutes across uh, six different countries. So thank you all by these. Um, for the rest, so the um, this chapter six uh, is the last research need and it actually represents some of the technological and methodological 
uh, cross-cutting research needs and requirements, which support research needs one to five. So some of the points may sound familiar from some of the previous presentations, quite a few actually, uh, but here they are more discussed as really cross-cutting needs, not specifically related to, to the thematic topics. Um, so we have uh, focused on five research questions here, um, which have a kind of logical flow through uh, them because they start with uh, the issues of data collections both uh, from a technical, uh, cost-effective, efficient uh, data collection point of view, but also uh, from the just and inclusiveness of data collection towards data handling and processing over dissemination of the results. So how do we actually uh, share and um, distribute these uh, research results to a wider community? And uh, also, last but not least, how do we kind of exploit uh, these research results, which is um, a terminology from the EU, but it uh, really has to, say how to do with how you can make use of the research results um, for different purposes. Um, so we are addressing uh, several needs in this uh, chapter. It's the need for uh, understanding the stakeholders and the right holders better. Um, and while this, um, like all the other research needs, apply to uh, both the poles, um, for the Arctic there's of course the extra um, issue that people are living in the Arctic uh, and not so much apart from a few researchers a year in Antarctica. So there is also the need for the Arctic to keep it a sustained homeland. Uh, there's a need for applied uh, technology-oriented research to support these uh, technological challenges that we have uh, uh, heard about in, in several of the other research needs. There's also the need for new and more efficient methodologies and practices around data acquisition, handling and uh, analysis uh, of data, and also the consideration of those different knowledge systems and, and ethical standards for that. So there's a, then a need uh, for adequate and um, targeted dissemination uh, material for the different uh, audiences, which could include capacity building and, and training as well. Um, because it's not really only the various research disciplines that would profit significantly from uh, each other's research results, but it's actually all actors uh, that would benefit from, from these uh, more tailored uh, dissemination of research results uh, to boost awareness about so the polar regions. Um, and then uh, last point that uh, we want to address here is how do we really, uh, what is needed to contribute to and ensure that these results outlive the project life cycles and, and the research projects so that they also can be used for a long time and that they can be used in other applications. Key question one is, um, we had a few uh, reviews um, back on, on this uh, question, on this topic, uh, to say that the co-production, why not co-production with uh, um, decision makers, policy makers, and yes, we agree that these are in, in important to include, but this is really about um, this chapter we have concentrated on um, the co-production of the indigenous knowledge, the local knowledge and the science and the kind of more traditional Western science we know. Uh, and we see that co-production co -production of uh, really means here of knowledge to combine the science with the local knowledge and the indigenous, the indigenous knowledge to solve uh, problems that uh, neither one or the other is uh, sufficient enough to do it by itself. So the background to these are that um, the uh, climate change and globalization and, and technology, technological progress, they basically uh, give way to changing economies and, and, and modern societies are shifting as well. So there's really a risk that the northern communities will face new challenges um, and this will especially be uh, uh, the case if the rate of change is faster than actual the, so the social systems can adapt to. Um, 
it's also well uh, accepted by now that research questions are no longer uh, only due to be based on science alone, but they really need to take into account the interaction with civil society, uh, governments and, and other stakeholders and um, private sector, for example. So there's a, there's, but there is an increased demand for science-based research and knowledge that uh, is gathered jointly with all these stakeholders so that we can find uh, sustainable solutions for uh, both these new economic activities, uh, but also for the people that are actually living in the region that they can basically uh, still have their sustained livelihood. Um, I also want to uh, say here how important it is that we do include the indigenous knowledge and the local knowledge in the research that is conducted. Uh, but it is not really down to simple integration of these different knowledge systems. We really need, that's where we need to move from integrating um, knowledge system towards co-production, which means that it's already from the beginning, it's the co-design of the project, it's, it's everything shared and, and also the ownership afterwards needs to be done. So I think important to know and to realize uh, also uh, through sci for scientists is that co-production can really benefit both the researchers and the local communities and, and also other stakeholders. Um, so there are some needs here that uh, need to take to be into account for co-production of knowledge. It's uh, what I said in the last slide, actually, there actually needs to be a raised awareness amongst researchers, how they can benefit from uh, co-production of knowledge and, and incorporating indigenous and, and local knowledge and, and work together with the knowledge holders and the right holders in that. Um, this also you need to really bring people in from the very beginning not just some afterthought um, you also when designing research projects uh, it has to be very uh, under, much understood that you need adequate resources and capacity to address these unique needs uh, it may be very different uh, needs than than with just purely natural sciences so there are, there's also a need for capacity building activities that address these local needs. Um, further, and, and also with data processing, I would say there's a need for adequate uh, ethical standards that you can achieve through dialogue with people. Um, and there's a better understanding needed of the different methods of, for co-producing co and sharing experiences. So uh, maybe there's more than uh, one method. And, the Arctic is also um, very diverse in, in its communities. So uh, there's really not maybe one fits all uh, methodology here. And there's also um, a need for research that assists in the goal determination of desired futures envisioned by stakeholders and right holders. And this applies actually to both the Arctic and, and Antarctic. Uh, for key question uh, 6.2, uh, which is to develop new technologies and improved capacities in observation, modeling and research in the polar regions. I will go quite fast through this because I think it's been covered by uh, in several of the previous presentations. So it, uh, the main message here is really that because of the harsh environment, um, there is poor coverage, both spatially and over time. Uh, there's also some kind of weak coordination between existing observing networks, there's limitations of remote sensing systems. Um, there is, uh, yeah, we need the, the new technologies, uh, new applications, um, novel applications also for uh, different observing methods, both in situ, both uh, uh, better uh, remote sensing techniques. Uh, bandwidth has been mentioned uh, in the past, but also new new technologies, re engineering parts, for example, or better batteries could be something here. So the needs here is that we need to measure key indicators for uh, changing climate and uh, related essential climate uh, variables uh, by autonomous uh, data collection systems. Um, and that this is where it comes in, where you have to also, you, you need to basically 
have renewable energy solutions if, if you need autonomous uh, data collection systems um, with low energy consumption. So maybe we need a new generation of batteries. Uh, develop uh, an integrated observational systems able to homogenize hom data across areas of different uh, temporal and spatial variability, support real-time access to data and uh, information from different sources, uh, addressing these current limitations in data collection, uh, integration, processing, and, and of, of course communication of information, implement intensive observational service, uh, both time and space and en enhance these uh, satellite observations um, and also look at the long-term uh, project projections of those and then introduce new technologies uh, for modeling and data assimilation. Um, FAIR uh, is uh, the topic of uh, the third key question, which is FAIR data management principles so for polar data collection. So FAIR has actually been uh, adapted by the EU already. It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable uh, data management. So uh, I think it's self-explanatory, but uh, findable basically it means that you need sufficiently rich metadata and a unique, with a unique and a persistent identifier. Um, accessible, it means that both the data and the metadata um, have to be understandable both for humans and machines. Uh, and the data has to be in a trusted repository. Um, interoperable, it, the, meta, the, the, the metadata mainly has to use some um, a formal accessible and shared uh, language um, and reusable that the data and the collections have actually clear usage license as need there and to provide accurate information on the provenance where it comes from. Um, so we need individual uh, scientists and communities and disciplines they have different mechanisms for documenting and sharing data so we need some efforts to improve the ability to understand this uh, data and information across communities. Um, we Technology can help there by setting standards and then also the issue of the need for uh, open data, uh, both in Antarctica data must be open and public, in the Arctic we have the uh, issue of uh, these ethical standards that we need for uh, how we apply social data and so on. Uh, the nature of data that need to be handled and combined in a consistent manner, including both the quantitative and the qualitative data from uh, natural and social sciences, um, and the ability to link information across informative uh, domains. I, I will start going a little bit uh, faster because otherwise I'll run out of time. Um, Key question 6.4 is about how to disseminate the results. So there has been basically an, inc an amazing increase in polar research, uh, but we need to bring this uh, research to different um, stakeholders and, and target audiences. And we can use a variety of channels and, and knowledge brokers uh, for that. Uh, we can also explore and evaluate uh, new and uh, known communication tools for that and we need data sharing uh, for creating synergies with uh, education capacity building policy uh, but of course not uh, the scientific community as well and uh, herefore we have to tap uh, scientific and knowledge resources for societal benefit and uh, to build capacity um, there's a good need for cross-border cooperation for higher education. Uh, we also need to understand and value the needs of all the stakeholders. Um, capacity building and education inside and outside the polar region is, is important. Uh, we also need to enhance the public understanding of the relevance of polar regions in their role for the development and preservation of cultural heritage. Um, and we need education on all levels basically, uh, but that needs constant development and, and we also need maybe new and innovative technologies and platforms. And this is basically more about, uh, previous we talked about the disseminating, but how this is more how to 
uh, use and make people use the results for other purposes. So um, integration of knowledge into polar decision making has already been reported to benefit planning and decision making in various uh, socioeconomic sectors um, and also for example for um, the prediction of risks and a more generalized and, and sustained exploitation of available knowledge to address these challenges is to develop uh, platforms based on community-driven research, uh, the use of participatory techniques such as scenario analysis and modeling and the uh, development of uh, prototypes or proofs of concept for uh, relevant products and services so that you can uh, illustrate how to uh, how you can use uh, the available knowledge. Um, there's also a more generalized and sustained exploitation of available knowledge to address these challenges uh, which would benefit from uh, again the participatory techniques maybe I've said this already um, the development of decision support tools and uh, the establishment of effective methods to improve policy uh, and understanding. So this is uh, a picture of where these participatory methods have, um, methods have been put in practice um, by Katarina, one of the co-authors here. And then this, uh, the research requirements here, summarized very briefly, is to uh, there's a need to better understand the added value of co-production of knowledge and guidelines on how this can best be done. We need basically investments and specific funding for this. Uh, we probably would uh, envisage, envisage uh, pilot and feasibility studies, uh, but it's important to really see what the long-term uh, involvement involvement of this is because you need to build trust with the local communities and and it needs to have a long-term vision so this needs to go as a challenge that you need to go beyond the uh, three to five years lifespan of, of normal research projects as we know them um, research that both uses participatory methods and tests possible future scenarios or modeling would be a uh, good uh, resource requirements to have coordinated calls to improve the technological capabil capabilities. So also go across uh, not just the natural scientists, but the engineers, the maybe private uh, industry and so on. So we need to develop uh, low cost and low energy communication systems. Uh, a scoping study on operational informatics for the polar regions could be a first step there. Furthermore, there's coordination and standardization of observ observation protocols. Um, so we need some kind of alloc time or resources allocated to, for the design and implementation of standardized data management. Uh, we need research that addresses interdisciplinary observations. Um, we need coordinated calls for seed money to enable co-production of projects uh, and support capacity building. We need cross-border higher education exchange programs and one idea would be to uh, strengthen some of the other programs or do something similar like the Erasmus project. Uh, there's a need to nurture public education and outreach initiatives um, and then the demonstration of pilot projects uh, on how uh, the research results can actually address the societal needs in practice. A little bit over time, but thank you very much, um, everybody that has contributed and also the EPRP team for giving me the opportunity to um, contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, so we are now going into a shorter discussion round as expected, but nevertheless, we will have a short uh, discussion round and I would like to ask all um, panelists to switch on their cameras so that uh, we can see you while you're answering the questions. Um, my colleagues here have compiled a lot of questions which were in the chat box for me and I will now pass uh, some of the questions directly to the authors and I will start with research need one so Jean Daniel or um, Singer there was one question from Vincent Ritter from CNRS and he asked if 
paleoclimatic questions are also uh, addressed in the research program, or if you focus only on present changes and processes. <laughs> Jean Daniel already ran away, so either Sina or <laughs> could you please, one of you, give an answer to this question? I will just uh, unmute, sorry. Uh, yeah. I can answer that, that uh, definitely uh, paleoclimate is an important part of the research program. Uh, and uh, it's definitely important to understand also the longer time scales. So uh, that is written in, although it is a rel relatively brief research program, but it is there several in several places if you look into it. Thank you, Sina. Um, any other comments? Otherwise, I will have a question here to research need two, so that everybody gets a question. Many people have commented on the uh, proposal of the polar observing decade, uh, which you are proposing. And I have a question here from Pip. Bridger, uh, and she asked, or he asked, if it's a metrological or climate only uh, campaign and refers also to the UN decade of ocean science and the Southern Ocean Observing System, which are also developing an UN decade. And in connection to that, Mike Sparrow also recommended to closely align this initiative with the YOP. Uh, Johnny, can you comment on what you are thinking is behind this decade a bit more in detail? I actually think that that's in the research uh, question uh, or research, the, the chapter one that we propose this. Okay, then I mix yes. it. So, sorry. <laughs> so, so I will answer. I think what, what, uh, what we were thinking and discussing, we and the co-authors, was that this is a general... Uh, uh, I, the general idea is to understand processes at, 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 at a more detailed level. Uh, and to do this, we need a, a period of, a, lo a long period where, uh, where a number of processes can be studied uh, to understand them better. Uh, and of course, it's mainly climatic and meteorological parameters we were thinking of. But at the same time, we also mention processes at many levels. Uh, so from, yeah, from, uh, from uh, could be cloud microphysics uh, to uh, TV connection patterns. Uh, but I think that since the uh, the overarching uh, 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 topic of uh, the research question one has been uh, the uh, uh, understanding the uh, the climate uh, better. It's it's mainly this, but it sh it can certainly be broadened to uh, to uh, to other topics also. Uh, so, of course, the ecological system is, is also part of it. Uh -huh. I can complete quickly. Yes, it's, it's uh, relatively op open. Also, you can think about uh, glaciology and biogeochemical cycle. Uh, there will be a li limitation to a decade, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in oceanography. You will have some processes that you might, might not capture in a uh, decadal time scale. Uh, but it is a long period of time and it is also a way to kickstart new observation uh, sites maybe that can uh, last longer than the decade itself. Uh, and of course, I, it's, it's a, I think we fully agree that it should be uh, in, in line with what has been done previously in the International Polar Year, in Yop, uh, and in uh, other uh, similar in initiatives. Just giving a more uh, depth and breadth to, the, to this concept. Thank you, both of you, uh, very much for answering this question. I have now a very general question to the panel and uh, you have to decide who should answer. It's a question from Eberhard Sauter from the Abi, and he asked, uh, 
How do you think academia industry collaboration can be fostered in the best possible way? Christina is laughing. Maybe you have something to say on that? <laughs> smiling, smiling. <now. laughs> smiling, yeah. Uh, I, I think that, uh, yes, I think that's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, what, what uh, I think um, getting industry on board in some of those uh, uh, Arctic projects as the EU has been doing and insisting on doing in, in, uh, is, is, a, is a, great, uh, a great start. We really need to build, uh, to build that, uh, to continue that dialogue and, and to understand um, the complementarity uh, that can exist and the collaboration uh, that needs to be done in order to ensure um, sustainable development in, in, in the Arctic. Uh, there's lots of, in, in the need for more data, um, industry uh, can bring uh, also a lot of value by uh, being one of the collaborators, by uh, um, helping a multiplying factor in, in data collection. When, when I talked about the social license to, to operate, this is something that needs to be done also with academia and, uh, and other stakeholders and for industry, it's, it's important if it's something that can be um, defined for, for the Arctic. So I, I really think that uh, uh, continuing uh, as it has already been um, started and uh, with uh, thanks to, to the EU, uh, um, in, in ensuring that representatives of industry are part of that dialogue and that this dialogue uh, continues and is enhanced uh, will really help in, in, uh, in having a, a solid uh, uh, research uh, program going on. Thank you, Christine. Um, I have here several questions also to Peter. I will now take one of these because we do not have too much time. And this question is from Annick Wilmot. And she asked, she wrote that learning from the past is very interesting and she's wondering if learning from what happens elsewhere should be included, especially when it comes to indigenous communities. So, so she's referring also to equatorial regions and uh, other regions uh, where indigenous people live and uh, um, also where economic activities are taking place. So, Question is, do you see a relation also to non-polar? Yeah. Yes, um, thank you for the question, first and foremost. Um, I, I, I can only strongly agree. <laughs> I, I can only strongly agree with this statement. So I think um, um, I, I think uh, lear learning from the past uh, is uh, goes in a variety of directions, spatial directions. Of course, the past is also a, a very relative concept. So what was yesterday is the past, and and uh, and also in the spatial sense. So of course, communities uh, focus very often on 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 their immediate uh, vicinity. But I think we have been for many years now um, observing this trend that, that many, for example, indigenous communities in the Arctic have been in very active dialogues with other indigenous communities elsewhere and have been doing exactly that, uh, kind of learning, learning um, from other people's experiences. So I think, yes, absolutely, this dimension should be included here. So thank you, Peter. And uh, another question, a bit related to this, which was asked to Peter and Tina. Uh, you can um, decide to answer. It's from Yuk uh, Lantui from Avi, and he asked, uh, "Have you?" So Tina and probably Peter, you mentioned the challenge of maintaining partnerships with local communities beyond the lifetime of a project. Do you have any thoughts what we could do or the EU could do to handle this when? shaping new projects. Dina, do you want to, pay to go first? So I, do you have any recommendations for the EU or other funders how we can overcome this challenge that all the connections we have built, for example, with indigenous communities end after the project ends? So I, I suggested uh, Tina to go first, but uh, if you prefer, I, I can. Oh, I, I can also go. Yeah. I, I mean, this is a very uh, elaborated, this actually requires an elaborated answer, I think. And thank you Uke, for listening in and for asking the question. Um, 
I think I mentioned a couple of the issues already in the talk that uh, we need basically to uh, involve the indigenous communities right from the start. This is extremely important. Uh, and I think that uh, at the European level, it's not always yet common to start the project planning by getting to know the problems of the people that are living there uh, in the region. Um, or these people's existing knowledge. This is not very often the starting point. Uh, so I think uh, in the last um, years, I think that has actually been started also in Nunatariuk, there's much better collaborate, uh, dialogue. Um, and I think another point is basically the long-term um, projects that, that is very important. I think it's, we need to know, uh, people need to know that they can trust us, that the, um, the research is going back to the community, so it's not only uh, we're using their knowledge, then it also has to go back to these communities. Um, and I think, yeah, trust and dialogue is, is really very important, but for the EU, I think um, two things is maybe to have more uh, dialogue already before they design these calls, uh, and then an afterthought to actually look in how we can address longer term uh, projects or yeah that's my short answer to this uh, if i i may just add to that i think i i you know it's um, obviously obviously everything that you know just said applies and and um, we as researchers of course would would like um, the eu and other funding agencies to to um, to uh, give longer term projects um, <laughs> that's um, and I, I think it's clear that 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 five years is, is really a period that you can do something and you develop relationships and and, and then then that, that it is a real challenge how how to how to continue after that I think from a perspective of an individual researcher clearly there's a strong argument to be made for not doing one project in point A and then uh, switching immediately to an, to another location, but having this, you know, seeing uh, research also as a social relationship that you're building up and that you're maintaining and continuing and then then um, trying to have follow-up projects um, with with uh, communities and in individuals with whom you already have rapport, with whom you have a a social relationship and and uh, so I, I think there is no there is no easy solution uh, to that very important issue that you brought up but I think um, both both institutionally and individually we we have some ways to to try to to approach this and and, and one is is really also what Tina alerted to this kind of maybe maybe demanding that more that 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 you have that you're not just saying I would like to go there and and have no 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 clue of the people there but but really demand um, documentation of 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 ongoing conversations with the people um, with whom you want to work with. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have a last very good question to you, and then we will have to move on. And this last question goes to all of you, <clears throat> and it was posed, now I have to find it, uh, by Gustav Siegemann, and he asked, what are your recommendations for the upcoming EU Arctic policy? Silence. <laughs> Anybody has an idea on that? So I heard a lot of, I heard a lot of, uh, comments on this already in your presentation. So better data management, uh, better inter, uh, also better implementation of policies. But is there anything someone of you want to say, Marie Noel? Yes, um, maybe that's a, just a, a small word. And I think what we want here is a new knowledge for a better societies. That's clear. But I think we shouldn't forget about innovation and that fundamental research is also instrumental to creation of new knowledge even though the benefit of it may not be maybe indirect and not necessarily and uh, immediately visible for societies. And I think fundamental research is also uh, the long-term view of the problem. I hope it's not totally perpendicular to what to the <coughs> mainstream of this, uh, <laughs> of this uh, workshop, but I, I think it's, it's important. And the second thing maybe is that the European dimension also should be fully taken into account and especially how we harmonize this uh, 
European framework of the, of the program with the international context. Uh, I mean, it's a question for politics and economy, of course, but it's also a question for research. We have a LED, LND project, uh, which are funded by the European community. How do we harmonize that with the umbrella initiative at the international and national levels? Any other comments on that? Yes, can I? Well, one thing I'm saying, thinking is that an important part of the, the European uh, policy could simply be the fact that uh, if, uh, research diplomacy, the fact that actually science is a very good way for collaboration with creating less tension uh, instead of more tension and I think that's why it's so important for mm -hmm. Europe with a program like this one because uh, yeah that science is a way to work in the uh, polar regions uh, to create a, a, a <coughs> well a more peaceful uh, uh, polar regions or keep them peaceful Thank you. That was a very nice word you know, for the end. Nicole, um, can I, uh, can I add to this? I, yeah. I, can't, I can't switch on my camera because uh, probably I left it on too long and now. Uh, but I just wanted to add to this that potentially um, the European policy could put more emphasis in the Arctic, in, in education and also bringing scientific uh, views and results to educational systems there and involve younger people for the for a, a sustainable future there as we do here uh, having school children involved in science I think that would be an important step also in Arctic populations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tony? Yes. So I think also that the European policy on this should also explore uh, um, ways to improve again the geopolitical situation up there. We, we cannot do this unless we are able to do it um, completely across the Arctic. And as it is right now, we have very strong limitations on this, particularly due to bad collaborations with the Russians uh, in these uh, waters up there. And I think. Uh, uh, to recognize the challenges that we are facing, we, we, we will not be able to solve all of this unless there is a new level of agreement between all the uh, relevant countries that are um, associated also in the members of the Arctic Council, for instance, that a, a new platform needs to be established for the research activity up there so we are able to take it all. Thank you. Okay, we're coming to an end and we have one final presentation mm -hmm. to do, a summary by KC, but I have to answer also one general question posed by Jean Bauer and I will do it now. Um, he asked when he can read the, the research program, so all in all details. I have to say we have done our reviews now and we are now in the final editing work. work. So um, you can expect that the research program is ready for download at least in a draft form, maybe not in a fully layouted version by end of this month from the EU Polar Network site. Also the infrastructure white paper, which I mentioned. So you have to be a bit patient. We need a couple of days more, but then uh, it should be available for download. And now we are coming to an end. And the last presentation of today is given by Kirsi Latela. She's from the University of Oulu. She is the chair of the European Polar Board, which is a very close cooperation partner of EU PolarNet and which is also supposed to take over the legacy of this project. And uh, Kissy is also the director of the EU Arctic Thematic Network. So Kissy, it's your turn. Thank you. And I think you can see my screen. Okay. Yes. Thank you for staying until the very end of this webinar. It has been a long day so far. So my concluding remarks will be all about the cooperation, coordination and collaboration, because these are the key pillars that have been mentioned many times already today as well. And of course, the whole European Polar Program that was just presented is a one good example of that kind of a good collaboration that has been going on 
across the disciplines, different regions, nations, different stakeholders and so on. And I will present the European Polar Board as one tool and platform that can be used to facilitate and really kind of implement this polar program. I have penguins here to remind all of you that European Polar Board, same way as the polar program, is a bipolar. So we do work in both Arctic and the Antarctic. And EPP throughout its 25 years of history has been working a lot with the polar regions and supported Europe's leadership in polar research. I have summit make a summary about the key recommendations. I have summed the four overarching main themes that you can find in each of the research needs. I, I'm not able to go over everything, but these are the four kind of a main points. And the first main point that has been said today is that we have to improve the cooperation and coordination of research, observations and operations. We have to improve the data interoperability and the sharing of it. We have to re improve the access to research infrastructures and increase the joint activities. And we have to improve the sharing of the knowledge and best practices among the different stakeholders in different regions in Europe and beyond. And these are the all things that EPP can work with. A few words about EPP itself before going into those details. Uh, as I mentioned, we are celebrating this year our 25th anniversary. EPP is a non-governmental organization hosted by the Dutch Research Council in Netherlands and our secretariat sits in Den Haag. And EPP's mission is really to promote, coordinate and advance European research in the polar regions by providing a single collaborative platform for European polar researchers. We had 27 members in 19 countries. You can see the members in your, in your right hand. And we have international partners, European partners, mostly the research project projects and the regional counterparts, which means the different type of polar organizations. And the, the core in a way is that EPP is a core platform where we share the information between our members and our other international organizations. And by providing a kind of one single contact point, the members are able to act together with the partners and develop the new projects and new collaboration and new initiative, which is a core thing of the whole thing. Our strength is in our members. As already mentioned, we have members who work in both Arctic and the Antarctic. They come from the different research and infrastructure organizations. It means that there's a really big mix of scientific excellence and skills. But they also have a national funding agencies and universities, etc., in our membership. And this diversity of organizations and our members mean that EPP is really able to coordinate the European polar community. We are able to coordinate the research, the logistics, and also the policies. So if we come back to the recommendations that were just stated, what EPP then can do? EPP can support international cooperation. And how we do that? We promote the multilateral collaboration activities between our members. We work towards further improving cooperation and access to polar research infrastructures. We share the knowledge and best practices, and we carry forward the legacy like the products that are developed in EU Poland. And I will do a few slides of each of these four points. So by promoting our collaborative activities, we can do that because EPP is, its structure is built in a way that we can facilitate and encourage our members and we can coordinate the whole activities. We can bring together the expertise from each members and by doing the collaborative approaches, we can develop the bigger consortiums like EU Polonet, which was actually based from the EEPP originally. The way the EPP is working is also through its action groups. And, and we have an action group on infrastructure, which is working towards for further improving the cooperation and access to polar infrastructures. It has a two bigger 
uh, tasks going on at the moment. One is finding the better accessibility to polar research infrastructures, which means that they are gathering the information about the different norms and different guidance and different ways to access the research infrastructures and trying to harmonize so that EBB members would have a better access. And the second one is a scoping study on mobile and interchangeable infrastructure in the polar region. So looking at the feasibility, would that be a feasible thing to do? I'm rushing because time is running out, sorry about that. Um, one good example is our online European Polar Infrastructure Database, which is currently being updated. And it's a joint project done with the Eurofleet's Interact CONMAP and EU Polarnet. And just one note to that, that because we are working on the both poles, we have a station from both Arctic and the Antarctic, but also the vessels and aircraft and information. We actively share knowledge and best practices, and we have another action group on environmental impacts of polar research and logistics, which is sharing best practices, for example, reducing the impact of polar, polar research. Plastics is obviously one thing, but there are also other things that has to be looked at. You have to find out what is the difference between the, between the environmental regulation due to human activity, and which is due to the, the normal climate change and environmental changes. There's an impact on research activities, and of course, there is a cumulative impact done due to the human presence in the Arctic and on the Arctic. An outcome, this group will develop a synthesis report and also the best practices and tools, tools uh, in a format of a recommendation paper so that all the research that is done in both poles in Arctic and the Arctic could do their best in minimizing the environmental footprint of their research. And fourth point is the carrying legacy. So the project like the EU Polarnet now, they are producing a lot of very good and useful products. And this was actually one question that someone just asked that how you maintain and sustain all these good products and everything that is done in these research projects. The EPP is offering a tool for that as well. And of course, that online database catalog is one. We do have that infrastructure catalog also in paper format also develop joint, it's a joint project. And this catalog is also a very good tool when you go out and meet the new international partners and, and, and start to develop in the new project. You can use this catalog kind of a good, good collaborative and go, go, go good information too. So overall, EBB works for better coordination for the better benefit of the society. We work to improve the coordination with our, within our polar research community. And we do that by acting that single contact point. And by that, we can ensure the full strength of Europe's voice. And we can also coordinate the efforts much better. We have a one example of the EBB and European Space Agency project where EBB has coordinated uh, the ESA project uh, access to, to Antarctic stations and they're overwintering stuff because they are looking at the health effects on those. So rushing through, uh, I cannot give this talk without saying anything about the current corona situation because it has shown that there has to be new ways of doing research. There has to be new ways of, of using the infrastructures and data and also working with, the, with together with the local and indigenous stakeholders in the case of the Arctic. And this also, as well as this implementing and getting this European Polar Research Programme in the full speed, needs and calls for more coordinated efforts, more collaboration and more sharing the best practices. And lastly, I mentioned the one of the other EBB action groups, which is an action group on international cooperation, which is the, the tool in EBB, which actually organizes and implements all these coordinated activities within our member organizations, our members and our partner organizations. All that, of course, needs also the communications. And I have just listed here a few types of the communication activities that, that we do. We do organize panels, we do have a videos, we have a follow-up, we have Twitter and so on. 
So I can see that I have one minute. Sorry for rushing through, but thank you. Nicole, you're muted. Thank you very much, Kesey. I'm sorry that you were the last one, but you made it until one o'clock. So um, <laughs> I think um, you have shown nicely that there is a future, even if Geopolarit is now ending and that we will cooperate all together on a European level and an international level to also implement some of the recommendations mm -hmm. of the research program. We have also, and I should say it now at the end, applied for a follow-up project for EU Polar Net 2 and with a close cooperation with the European Polar Board, but we don't, still do not know if we are successful. So from this point of view, uh, they, they, we have to be a bit patient until we get the uh, results from the evaluation. But nevertheless, independently from that, we will continue to work on it. And I think also that EU Poland in the last five years has shown how important it is to work across Europe in international cooperation, but especially also across all disciplines and with all people related. The view you get, and it's now my personal view, which I, with which I would end this uh, meeting. As a geologist, by education, I learned a lot from the cooperation with the social scientists and the other disciplines. It was a very, very interesting endeavor. It's time to finalize now, or it's time to close now, and I would like to thank all of you, and I would like also that all of you switch on your video camera again, and uh, especially those little Heinzelmännchen, as we call them in German, so those who helped here with the organization of the conference, and I especially mean Venuka, Joseph, and David. So um, a special thanks goes to three, all three of you. You were really working here behind uh, uh, the last three hours behind the scenes and in preparation of the meeting. A big thank you to all of you three for your super big help. And. Uh, I will make a quick screenshot to have a, um, to have even if the others have not switched on, but doesn't matter, to have at least a group picture. So, thank you. Okay, um, it's time for a lunch and for other work for today. I was, I have to say, I was really impressed how many participants have attended this meeting. We were well, at maximum times, well beyond 250 active participants and additional participants in our YouTube channel. And we had in total more than 600 reg registrations for this webinar. So there's obviously a lot of interest in the work we are doing. And we hope that we can at least put some of our ideas forwards also for funding in the future. I thank you very much, everybody. It was a nice morning and I enjoyed it very much. Um, have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.